What is going on guys and welcome finally to my Better Call Saul season five review. We're on our little break, our little hiatus now for a couple of weeks until we get the final episodes of Better Call Saul. And now season five is the last previous season review that I need to cover. So be sure to watch my buddy Sean Chandler's review as well. That's gonna be a link down in the video description. He'll also be giving his thoughts on season five. Now this one, just like with season three, just like with season four, is among the best television that you're going to get from this Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul crew. After season three, the show took a dramatic shift for me, and season four and five have been very consistent with that. And this was, if nothing else, a fantastic setup for the final season of Better Call Saul. And I love the fact that this is the first season in the Better Call Saul timeline that we actually get the full character of Saul Goodman. By the end of season four, Saul has completely lost Jimmy. He has completely disavowed that entire side of his life, that entire side of his history, and that name altogether. And this is where we start to see the kickoff of the character that we eventually come to know in Breaking Bad. He has changed his name to Saul Goodman. He's practicing law under this. He's going more for the criminal element. Everybody that he spent season four buying or selling all of these little burner cell phones and trying to kind of scam his way into being a successful cell phone store. He is now going after that clientele, continuing to sell these burner cell phones with the little speed dial button that goes right to him for any of their lawyerly needs. And going along with that full Saul personality, this is the first season where you really see Jimmy or Saul really go after Howard Hamlin. I mean, there's a point in the season where Howard starts to realize that he probably didn't treat Jimmy all that well, probably has some regrets, is genuinely trying to remedy that, trying to be a better person, trying to fix mistakes of the past between him and Kim. And so he offers Jimmy the job that he wanted years ago at Hamlin, Hamlin McGill. And rather than take that as like this big character growth for Hamlin, rather than take that as this big like moment between them where they can let the past lie, Saul gets extremely pissed off and insulted at this and then just basically does this prankster vendetta against Howard for the rest of the season. Starts throwing bowling balls over his gate to destroy his car. Starts pulling these little pranks where he sends hookers into a business meeting to make Howard look like a piece of shit. And that slowly sets up a big, big element that's going to be carried over into the what we see now in the final season of Better Call Saul, but it is the ultimate moment where he is just completely let go of any of the dreams or any of the aspirations that he had as Jimmy McGill. Saul Goodman is now his own thing. He's going his own route. He's cutting his own path. And anybody that thinks that Jimmy is coming back is going to find out the hard way that that is not happening. To the point where this might be my favorite season as far as the dynamic between Kim and Saul, because this is the first season where they kind of go against each other slightly. They're still pulling scams. They're still working together. They're still friends and having each other's back to the point where Kim Kim is really trying to screw over her main client, Mesa Verde, because she wants this old man who has this piece of property that he will not let go. He's going to have to have it bulldozed while he is inside before he lets Mesa Verde take it away from him. And she works together with Saul to try to come up with all these little schemes, all these little scams to keep delaying and put a thorn in the side of the main Mesa Verde guy to try to manipulate the situation. And eventually it comes to a point where Kim wants to stop. She's, we've had enough. We've tried. We've tried everything. We just need to let sleeping dogs lie. We need to admit now that we have failed and this is just not going to be something that we're going to be able to uh, manipulate the way that we want. And Saul goes behind her back for the very first time and throws the Hail Mary that eventually does get them their way, but it causes a bit of a rift between them for about an episode to where she does not like the fact that she became the pawn in his game. So many times they were working together, they were scheming together, planning together, and this was the first time where he went behind her and kind of used her against herself to get what they ultimately wanted. And it leads to them finally becoming married. So it works out in the end to a certain extent. I'm very curious where we're gonna get the, the final answers of their marriage in the final season because obviously we've never seen that character in Breaking Bad, but 
very funny motivation to finally get these two hitched is that, uh, yeah, you know, we're going to fuck each other over a little bit, so we might as well get married so we're not ever forced to testify against each other. Will you marry me? I do. But along with that, I do like the character growth that we get out of Kim Wexler in this season as well, because it's been clear for a season or more that even though she initially wanted to be the Mesa Verde person, she wanted to have this partnership eventually with the uh, Schweikertz and Copley, I believe is the name of the, the law firm. She wanted all these things. But now that she's had some perspective, now that she has seen that she's able to achieve these things regardless of how many obstacles are put in front of her, that she's able to manipulate things a little bit more and she, she sees the, the potential good in what she's able to possibly bring to the, the field of law that she eventually leaves all that behind and just does pro bono. You know, it comes to a point where she wants morally to help these people that aren't able to afford or aren't able to achieve this gigantic law firms and all these, these, these practices that she has been tied with for so long that she's willing to give up her biggest client. She's willing to give up this huge career opportunity to go and cut her own path as well. And it comes out of tragedy to a certain extent to where I'll talk about it more later on, but there's an episode where Saul nearly dies and that kind of brings this new perspective to her. And so just as much as Saul is now cutting his own path, going his own way and leaving all of those past aspirations behind, Kim is also doing the same thing in a much more moral, in a much more um, commendable fashion, but also doing that same thing where she's going to go her own way and do what she wants to do. I love the increased buildup and the increased screen time of the character of Lalo Salamanca. I think that by the time Better Call Saul ends, he's going to be one of my favorite characters of both of these shows. And I, the little bit of a tease that we got for him in the last couple episodes of last season was just enough to really build up how intense and how entertaining and charismatic this character was going to be. Hey guys, I come in. But in season five, it has just expanded so much to where that main storyline now going on with the Gus cartel side of Better Call Saul is about Lalo trying to take down Gus. Even though everybody in the cartel is telling him to stop, he is dedicated, he is loyal to Hector, his uncle, Tio, and so he is trying to take down Gus. He's trying to find out what Gus is up to because he knows with that smart ass intellect, there's something going on that they don't realize. He almost got to the bottom of it with the underground meth lab at the end of season four, didn't quite get there. We're still seeing him kind of pursue that in season six, but now it's more so about just trying to fuck with his business. And Nacho is stuck between all of this. And this is probably the most exciting season as far as Nacho's involvement, because he's tied between two very scary and powerful people, Lalo and Gus. Gus has him by the balls. Gus has him dead to rights and is forcing him to kind of be this double agent within the cartel. And at the same time, while he is getting closer to Lalo, while he is gaining Lalo's confidence and his friendship and everything, it's cool to see those characters get together and, and kind of interact a bit because it feels like they genuinely would be cool together. He's the one Salamanca that uh, Nacho actually could get some actual human relationship with, but it's all a fallacy because he's there under Gus's directions. And so this constant tug and pull of Nacho and his loyalty and what he's trying to do and trying to meet the expectations of both of these people for very different reasons was very intense. And I will say, as far as all of the episodes of Better Call Saul that I have seen thus far, Bagman is the best episode of this entire series in my mind. And that's a tall order. There's some great episodes in this series, but Bagman is like one of those standout episodes that I love in Breaking Bad. These isolated little bottle storylines that are just such an entertaining hour of TV to where you have Saul is trying to get Lalo off, is trying to get him released on bail, has to come up with $7 million, and Lalo's like, oh, I got that, just buried out in the desert, just go and, you know, go meet up my murder cousins, go meet up with them, and they'll give you the money and just bring it back, and it turns into this dire situation where bullets are flying, people die, and Saul and Mike, who has been out there sniping people, now have to trek their way all the way across the New Mexico desert with no water, no car, no resources, and it's just a really cool, interesting little character isolation of those two uh, in a way that's really cool to see kind of how their relationship has grown from the first two seasons where they were just kind of working with each other on some schemes and now they're full on stuck in this cartel life. 
and them trekking across the desert, dodging this one cartel member who keeps driving around trying to see them. The desperation that eventually kind of overcomes Saul. He has to end up drinking his own piss. And Mike, just being the bad motherfucker that he is, just stays cool as a cucumber the entire time. The way that they eventually dispatch this final cartel member with using Saul as bait. And Mike takes him out with a sniper rifle just as he's driving full on like 60 miles an hour. And the car crash that ensues. It's an episode that I really looked forward to going back and revisiting all the way back when I started season one on this most recent rewatch. It, it's definitively my favorite episode of this entire show thus far. And the final thing that I will say that this season does tremendously well is set up all these little pieces for the final season. It sets up these questions that we cannot wait to have the answers to. Going all the way back to the cold open where you finally get another piece of what has been going on with Gene the post Breaking Bad side of Saul. And the guy that was his cab driver that I would have swore was William Forsyth is just this random guy who used to live in Albuquerque, confronts him in the mall, and more or less manipulates him into admitting that he is Saul Goodman, which leads to yet another interaction with Robert Forster, rest in peace, the vacuum cleaner guy that is going to give him another identity. And he calls, he's getting ready to put even more money to relocate and redo his identity for a second time and then Saul stops and says, no, I'm going to handle this myself and hangs up. And we have yet to see, even halfway through the final season, where that has gone. I don't know if we're going to get that answer in the first episode of the next half of the season. I don't know if they're saving that for the final episode, the finale. I really don't know, but I'm still lingering on that question of, what does that mean? What is he going to do? Is he going to kill this guy? Is he going to go turn himself in? Like, I, I, There's so many questions that I have just regarding that little four to five minute cold open that I cannot wait to have answered even still halfway through season six. I just want you to admit it. Say it. Better call Saul. You have the whole setup with Nacho and Gus and Lalo for this final showdown, this final cartel explosion to where Gus has instructed Nacho to aid them in letting these assassins come into Lalo's compound and finally just wipe him out, which leads to one of the most badass sequences as far as villains in both of these shows, where Nacho lets all of these obviously professional, like military trained assassins into this compound and Lalo just fucks up every single one of them and stomps off right before it guts to black and shows the credits like the Terminator. And you're just like, oh, he is going to fuck people up in the final season. And we've seen little snippets of that thus far and how badass this dude is incredible setup for his final part of his story, as well as the final bit of the story of Nacho to where I kind of feel like he didn't necessarily want to do that. Like he actually kind of liked Lalo a little bit, but he's just so between a rock and a very hard place that he is now going to be the butt end of this entire feud and it's going to come down hard on him eventually. And the final piece, which was somewhat unexpected, it was the one, the one little domino that I did not expect to be finally falling by the end of season five is Kim's dark turn to where they're sitting around and after everything seems to have calmed down, Lalo is out of the picture. So they think Jimmy was not killed in the desert. Everything's starting to look up. Kim's doing her pro bono work. Saul is succeeding very well with his little side practice. And they come up with this little joking conversation about, you know, it would be pretty easy to really fuck up Howard's life if we really wanted to. I mean, we could kind of do this. We could kind of ruin his reputation. You know, a fringe benefit to that is we could get all that Mesa Verde, or excuse me, all that Sandpiper money. And it starts off as a joking conversation. And throughout the dialogue of the two actors, you start to see the tone very subtly change from what if jokes to are we really doing this? Are we really talking about this? And it's amazing that Saul is the one that looks at this entire conversation and goes like, look, I fucking despise this guy, but does he really deserve that? And that's the question the audience has been asking every single time they go after Howard, even through to season six, where it's like, does this guy really deserve this? I don't think so. He's a prick, but come on. But Kim is the one who's like, no, oh, finger guns. Yeah, we could do this. It'll be fun. And so I'm still waiting. The jury is still out because we still have six or seven more episodes left. But I think that there might be a way to retroactively go back and view Better Call Saul as kind of the Breaking Bad storyline for Kim Wexler. 
uh, the whole storyline regarding how far she is going to take this vendetta against Howard Hamlin and the way they set it up with this final episode to tease what eventually happens in the final season is just a great way to finally just tip her right over the edge into now she is doing some evil bad shit. She's not just manipulating things and working with Saul to do some good, at least for what she intends for her clients or for certain people that she wants to do good for, or maybe be a little bit selfish for her own and Saul's own reasons. Now they're using their powers for evil and she's the one steering the ship. The only thing that I could say about this season, which is pretty much a full-on negative for me, it's not something that's bad about this season, but it's a disappointment since I love this character so much, is... I think this might be the least interesting season as far as what they do with Mike. And Mike is arguably my favorite character of this entire universe. You have this storyline here to where after having to kill Werner in season four, which was a great storyline for Mike, he's very conflicted, doesn't want to work for Gus anymore, and so he quits the cartel at the beginning of this season. And so the rest of the season kind of just plays out as trying to recruit Mike again. He goes off and he's spiraling out of control and he's picking fights with these hoodlums on the street, he gets beat up, gets stabbed, and then finds himself healing off in this little cartel safe house and kind of gets his way weaseled back in with Gus because Gus has saved him. He's like, come on, dude, you can make a lot of money for your granddaughter. You can get stabbed after that. And so that's really the extent of his storyline. Aside from being the middleman between Nacho and Gus, there's not really a whole lot of big things that happen regarding Mike's character this season. And, you know, they're, they're getting better about that in season six. So I think that maybe some of that was necessary, I guess. But for somebody that loves that entire half of this storyline, even though it's called Better Call Saul, it's kind of half Mike's show past a certain point. I think this season doesn't do the best job at having the most compelling storyline for that character. Overall, guys, another awesome season of Better Call Saul. I don't quite think it's as good as season three. To me, that's kind of the pinnacle of this show, but it's very close, if not pretty much tied with season four. Some of the best television that you're going to have, and I think that it sets up the final season of what we've got so far in Better Call Saul masterfully. All right, guys, that's it for this one. Please be sure to check out Sean Chandler's review in the video description down below. If you click over here, you'll see the rest of my Better Call Saul reviews as well as my ranking of the Breaking Bad seasons. Thank you so much for watching and as always remember opinions are like assholes but that doesn't mean that you have to be.